-hmm. and growing up and I know you can probably relate but like growing up I just remember like constantly being reminded of how you know how I had to watch my actions and like how like each of my behavior like what I did and how that was like reflected or perceived upon those identities and you know it felt you know kind of like a like a balancing act you know you know some days I was too gay to be black and then other days I was too black to be gay it was kind of like what well, damn you know I kind of <laughs> like what do y'all want me to do Let's raid. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the first chapter of Reading and Raging with Charles C. Patton. I am Charles C. Patton, and thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. This chapter is a conversation that I had with Rodney Williams. So let me tell you a little bit about Rodney. Rodney earned his bachelor's degree from Claflin University. He created the first mainstream LGBTQIA plus organization on Claflin's campus called Everyone for Equality. He organized the first ball in Orangeburg County and was crowned legendary status for his contribution to the community. And as president of Claflin's modeling troupe, Envo, he revolutionized the company and expanded beauty standards within Orangeburg and the surrounding Southeastern community. Rodney and I actually met about two or three years ago when we both attended a leadership conference for human rights campaign. Ever since then, we have cultivated a friendship built on mutual respect and admiration for one another, constantly learning from each other, whether it be for modeling, arts, social justice, or the wineries we would have with other mutual friends. I have always loved our talks with one another, and that is why I asked him to be a part of this series. In this chapter, we base our discussion on his blog, The Bridge, specifically two works, Coming Out versus Letting In and Being Black and Gay in America. We discuss the nuances that are associated with identity and what it looks like to show up for ourselves and other marginalized communities. This conversation was steeped in love and honesty, and I learned so much as I was talking to him like I do every single time we have a conversation. I hope that when listening, you find a deeper understanding of self and the impact that these systems that we've been born into has manifested itself in our lives and how we present ourselves to the world. Now, we did have some technical difficulties while filming. My video is a bit choppy and the audio is not the best. We thought while we were talking that it was actually coming from his end, but it was actually coming from mine once I uh, rewatched everything that we discussed. And please don't, you know, worry. You will be able to listen and listen intently to what we are discussing. The content is absolutely incredible and that's why I wanted to share that with you. And what we will do for each chapter is we will give you a word that we feel like gives the fullness and encapsulates the feeling and intention behind the conversation that we have. The word for this chapter is emancipation. Emancipation of societal norms, of ego, of other people's expectations of you, and emancipation of what we've been conditioned to know as truth. We hope that this grounds you and provides you the intention behind the words and allows for you to open your hearts and minds for such perspectives. Now, I'm going to keep reminding every single one of you that you must, must, if you are 18 and you are a U.S. citizen, please register to vote. Please register for your absentee ballot. And if you are able, please vote early. Again, I will be reminding you until your ears turn blue, and hopefully that will be the same thing that happens to the Senate and the presidency come November 3rd. 
The link to do all of these things is in the description below and it really only takes a few minutes. If you are apprehensive about this election, again, I completely understand why you would be. But just like Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez so eloquently put, voting for Joe Biden is not about whether you agree with him. It's literally a vote to let our democracy stand another day. With that being said, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to Reading and Raging with Charles C. Patton, the podcast. Through an in-depth analysis of creative written works, thought-provoking conversations, as well as critical commentary on the world around us, RRC serves as a haven for individuals that yearn to inspire and awaken the light from within. Designed to aid each of us in our journeys for self-discovery and enlightenment, pushing us closer to actualizing our unique purpose. We can't wait for you to be a part of this conversation. And now, let's rage. doing how are you doing with all this quarantine shenanigans that's going on and all the civil unrest that's happening this your life and how you're feeling in these moments mm -hmm. i want to thank you as well for you know inviting me into this space i really i really appreciate it <laughs> but yeah a lot a lot a lot has been going on and i think for me i had to take a time to like learn how like to process like my emotions and to like just yeah. process like everything that was going on because you know you had corona and then you had you know the civil unrest and then police brutality and you know black deaths and even trans death and it was just hitting me all at once to where you know i in a moment i felt like it was just too much yeah. so you know there were some times where you know i had to take like social media breaks or, you know, I had to, like, just write and, like, journal, like, how I felt. And, like, just, you know, effectively, like, processing what I was feeling, you know, during these moments. Yeah, I definitely resonate with that because I, there was some time where I was in denial of everything happening. Like, I just, I don't know why I just thought, like, oh, this is just going to be for a little bit and we're going to be <laughs> fine. But then as the months went on and on. I'm like, okay, so this is, and then people started, you know, more and more people started dying in this country and abroad. And mm -hmm. it just seemed like, um, you know, the people that are supposed to be our leaders, they weren't telling us the full story of everything. And it just mm -hmm. felt like, it felt like we were in a movie. It still does. And yeah. uh, I definitely know that like having to come in your emotions and try and understand them and not try and like block them away and mm -hmm. try and be dumb with stuff because that's just that's just a recipe for disaster at the end of the day because mm -hmm. it'll all hit you at one time so you are uh someone that i consider to be um uh a, a wordsmith of sorts <laughs> And I say that because your relationship with uh, with written works and with words, period, is uh, something that I love to uh, lay witness to. Uh, you have a blog that you started, what, two years ago? Yeah, I think, yeah. It's about, it's about two years ago? Yeah, two or one. Yeah, and can you speak a little bit of like why you decided to start this blog and, and why you wanted to get your words out there for other people to read? Mm -hmm. So, I would say like the early years of like undergrad, you know, I think I've like changed and like transformed like so much. 
Like I just remember like during my freshman year, you know, where I felt like, you know, everything had to be, you know, perfect. You know, I had to show up, you know, every time, you know, in every space that I was in. And I had to learn like along the way that, you know, transparency and authenticity, you know, people see that first. Mm -hmm. And I think like when you share your story, it's like in ways you don't know like who you're inspiring, like you don't know who's listening. And I think this started like with my own, you know, group that I had at undergrad, like with my friends. And like when I started to like share the experience that I went through and I saw like the reaction from like other people, mm-hmm. you know, it was kind of like a, oh shit, like, yeah. you know, you know, in some way I'm helping somebody. Hmm? I was just saying people like resonated with it. They, it spoke to them. Yeah. And like in some way I was helping them make sense of their reality through my story. Yeah. So I thought, you know, hey, you know, how can I put this like on a grander platform? And, you know, I thought about vlogging and I was like, no, I don't know about vlogging because that's like a lot of, you know, consistency. And and then I thought about, you know, blog and I was like, oh, that'll be perfect for me because I like to journal. I like to write. So this is like, we like something easy for me. Yeah. And this is when I met you, well, when I really met you and we had like a full conversation, uh, it was really apparent to me that you are a very introspective person, that you take the time to understand what you're feeling, what your experiences were, how they influence how you think of the world today, and the way that you express that out with words and even through the conversations we had or the wineries that we would have, when we were in undergrad like that was that was something that I didn't know that I needed because it was something I was searching for for someone or a group of people to have real conversations about things that they're experiencing about things that they see in the world that's not surface level and when you came out with the uh with the blog well when I was introduced to the blog And there were two in particular uh, blog posts that really uh, stuck with me. And it was the uh, coming out versus inviting in and being black and gay in America. And uh, that was what, when we were having our conversation before this, but that was two things, those are two things that we, we agreed on that that was something that we could definitely have a full conversation about something that we've been yearning to have a conversation about actually <laughs> yes. so, uh, it was perfect for us to to use that as a catalyst for this conversation that we want to have so can you give like a little insight on what these yeah. on what these two written works are and and what inspired you to write them mm-hmm. so I can say with both, these were like definitely, definitely like conversations that like needed to be had and like not even for our generation, but like even for like the youth, I wanted to create like two projects that, you know, sparked conversations, you know, much needed conversations, you know, within our generation and then, you know, also for the youth because, you know, this, these were like two things that we have already went through and that or we are like currently dealing with but then also issues that you know the youth will also have to face as well yeah so what uh so if you can define the difference between coming out and inviting in like what is that language coming from like why do people use those terminologies can you elaborate on on those two things Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you look at like language, I think like with language, like language is powerful. And like, if you reflect like through history, like the language that we use, you can see how it was like necessary for like the culture and like historical context. And I think like the term coming out, I think, you know, that's just what it is. You know, it was appropriate for that time and only that time only, because, you know, during that time, you know, many people made it you know known that you know our existence was you know unnatural or immoral like you know 
Yeah. It's like many, All many things that they said. So it kind of like forced the people who identify within that community, you know, to repress, you know, hence the term, the closet. So like that space where, I don't want to say you're afraid, but I think, you know, like you're, like you're in a yeah. repressive place. Like you feel as right. if you cannot live your authentic self. Right. And I think with like coming out, you know, that's what it is. You give people the power of how you move and how you live your life. And I think, you know, moving forward, you know, as time has been transition and even like the changes that we've seen, you know, within the community, you know, the acceptance and equality, you know, I think we must, you know, change, you know, the terms that we use to, you know, order our lives, you know, and that's why, you know, I loved in inviting in, and this was during the HRC summit with Ryan, Jamal Swain, and he mentioned it, and I was like, like, it blew yeah. my mind, I was like, right. wow, because I, like, I never thought of that, you know, perspective, you know, and I think he said, I'm not sure what exactly what he said, but he said something to the extent where inviting in gives you back that power. Yeah. You know, you know, I'm telling you this only because I want to and whether or whether right. not you accept or, you know, validated, you know, that has nothing to do with me, but with right. you. And I was like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Because even if you think about like, the idea of coming out, it's like, okay, I'm here. Like you're leaving yourself open for anything and everything to come onto you and inviting in. It's like, okay, so you're being, uh, you're being intentional on like who you are, you know, inviting into your space, into your energy and allowing to you know, mix with your own stuff. So I love the terms. I, 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 when I heard that, it was, I think, very similar to what you experienced. I was like, wow, like, this is, mm -hmm. this feels right. This feels <laughs> yeah. like I can, I can control, I'm bringing the power back into my own life with it. So I definitely agree with like, all of that. And you wrote in the blog that uh, some of you may argue that modifying language by using and writing in, then coming out is pointless but I believe that it is important to unpack the terms that order our lives and represent us. So how important is, uh, how important are words to you in, in using the right terminology for, for the experience of a human life? Mm -hmm. I think like language is like, like I said earlier, like language is important. And I think people they don't understand the importance language have because, you know, the mind is so powerful. So like what comes out of like your mouth, like you create your own reality. It's kind of like manifestations. So like when you use like repressive or like any kind of terms, you know, similar to like coming out or anything, you know, you kind of order your life in that kind of way. And that's how you, you know, that's your outlook on like the world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that a lot of times people, like some some folks might not understand it in, in a way that like, when you receive the words and the language that you can use to, to describe or explain how you feel inside or how you want to be seen or, or any of those things, it's like, it's almost like you break free of so many different constraints and you can finally yeah. be who you're always meant to be. And mm -hmm. I just, I love, I'm such a fan and a lover of words and language. And even like through my, um, when I was like an undergrad and, and my training through, you know, physics and all of that, like the understanding that words literally have an energy to them. Every single word that you that you say, every single thing that you put out into the universe has uh, has energy associated to it, meaning that it has some sort of power on it. And I'm so, and because it's literally it's waves, like it, the frequencies of ever, like it's it's literally energy. 
And so that's why I love when, when how you are, how your relationship with words and language and how you have been able to cultivate this, this community of people and community of, of uh, like-minded individuals and even people who might not think like you, but you're able to, to give them, you know, this mm-hmm. language and this, these experiences that, you know, might be similar to them, but give them a whole new perspective of what life means. And I remember seeing on your page that you wrote, uh, I wanted to create a space for readers to imagine and experience a link to our past and a glimpse into our future, charging information with emotion and inspiration with action. So what does that, what does that mean for you? I think for most people and like, even like the name of my blog, so it's the bridge because for most people, you know, they have this belief that, you know, my suffering, you know, isolates me from you. You know, when that is not true, you know, your suffering is a bridge. You know, what you went through is unique with you, but then can also help me understand, you know, my situation. Right. And I think like with most people, you know, we're like afraid, you know, sometimes we're afraid, you know, to tell our stories, you know, in fear of being judged or in fear of being invalidated or in fear of being silenced. And I think I can understand that fear. But however, I think, you know, we must learn how to move through that, you know, to give right to our lives, you know, to give right to our experiences, you know, and say, you know, hey, you know, my story, you know, is validated. And, you know, my story should be, you know, shout out on all of the mountains, you know, whether you agree with it or not, it's my story, you know, is my existence. And I love that because child i'll tell you i I think all of us have experienced some sort of loneliness or or even abandonment feeling like either that's trying to trying to navigate spaces that aren't necessarily welcoming to the type of people that we are and uh in navigating the space of the like the intersection between being queer being gay being however you identify and being black especially in this country. And it's like when you were writing uh, the blog, Being Black and Gay in America, I definitely uh, felt you on when you were talking about the intersectionality of suffering and what that looks like and how we internalize that as Black people and specifically Black queer people. So can you give like a little... uh, touch on just a little bit of like what intersectionality means for you and how that has shown up in your life. Mm. So I'm trying to see how to word this. Mm. So intersectionality is kind of like, I think the biggest distinction that we have to make like with intersectionality is that, you know, our identities are not, you know, oppressive. You know, I think what is oppressive is like the places in which, you know, they are ranked in society, you know, man-made, you know, structures. And I think once we understand that, and I think, you know, that can make like sense of things. So like for me and you, you know, identifying with like three, you know, social identities, you know, black, male, and then gay or queer, or same gender loving, you know, to understand your struggle, you have to understand, you know, how each one is unique and right. how like each one like plays on top of each other. You know, you have to understand like all of that. Yeah. Because if you don't, Absolutely. I think you'll like stay in like a state of, you know, of being a victim. Yeah. You know, more so right. of a survivor. Right. Absolutely. And then not even even understanding like privileges that you hold in certain spaces and understanding that just because like just because you were born this way or born with certain uh certain privileges that uh that allow for opportunities to to fall into place it doesn't mean that you should like apologize for who you are 
but there is space for you to uh, to allow for an apology of sorts for how the society uh, demeans other groups of people that don't align with your identity. Wow, I agree. So you, on like speaking of like privileges and intersectionality and all of this, you say in your blog, being black and gay in America, it is important to be aware of the multiple layers of identity, of identities and the effect the layers can have. By using this lens, we can understand where we stand. We can understand where we stand in the struggle for freedom, as well as where we stand to help others who may not share the privileges we have. And when I read this, I took from it that basically how, you know, black folks uh, are, you know, how we say and we like give this, uh, we don't really give this room, but, but we're not even really searching for, but especially in these past months, we've seen a lot of white people or people who are, who are not black uh, take on this mantle of allyship and of of being a voice uh, to their people, amplifying uh, black voices and the struggles that we face in this country, and using their privileges as almost a barrier for that to happen. So, like, what can you give? Like, just touch on like what you meant when you were writing this, and and how you came to understanding. Uh, your own privileges and what that looks like in uh, the context of being uh, of intersectionality. You mean like the blog? Yeah. Well, the the specifically the when speaking of being black, gay, and also being a cisgender male, if that's like what your identity is. Oh yes. So. Like for me and you, like for like, you know, black, gay, or queer men, you know, for acceptance, you know, it poses like a greater challenge. You know, I think like on both fronts and like even other fronts, you know, we fight the fight for like acceptance, you know, freedom and equality on all fronts. Mm -hmm. And growing up, and I know you can probably relate, but like growing up, I just remember like constantly being reminded of how, you know, how I had to watch my actions and like how like each of my behavior, like what I did and how that was like reflected or perceived upon those identities. And, you know, it felt, you know, kind of like a, like a balancing act, you know, you know, some days I was too gay to be black. And then other days I was too black to be gay. It was kind of like, what the hell? You know, I kind of <laughs> like, what do y'all want me to do? Yeah. And like, it was just, it's kind of like a rope and it's like pulling you, you know, to where one side, you know, thinks you have to be more to be accepted. And then the other side, you know, thinks you have to be more to be accepted. And it's right. kind of like, like that frustration, like it's, it's a lot. Do you feel like you you felt that that tension like pulling you back and forth from this idea that we have in our community about like what masculinity looks like, how it shows up in this society, and how men in particular need to to express themselves from like either family or from friends or even just seeing stuff on the media? Oh yes, like I think like for a lot of like what goes on today. I think, you know, looking at the root of it, I think, you know, a lot of like intergenerational trauma that has just been passed down and like undealt with, yeah. you know, so that trauma, it manifests in behaviors that we don't even see. Right. And like, even like within our own communities and like our own spaces, we replicate the oppression that we've been through. And I think for most people in our black communities, you know, they do the same you know, to where, I'm not gonna say all straight black men, but for some straight black men, you know, they feel as if they have to police our femininity because, you know, once there were police of their masculinity. So it's Absolutely. kind of like the, mm -hmm. Yeah, and like, even, even with, I remember there were so many times when I was younger and I would just be walking or minding my own business or whatever. I remember there was this time in school and 
I was walking down the hallway. I felt like I, you know, had a nice outfit on. I was, you know, ready to go to class. It was early in the morning. I was in a good mood. Uh, and I was just, you know, being me, just walking in the hallway. And I remember hearing behind me, it was like two girls or like two, or like some, some people behind me were saying, oh, why are he walking like that? And I just immediately clinched up and then I start and I was like, oh, okay, you're doing too much. You need to think about how you're walking. Don't, you know, put a little, you know, pizzazz or whatever you want to call it in your walk. Make sure you're doing something that, you know, doesn't bring negative attention to you. And like, have you, have you had any experiences where there was this blatant or, or even an indirect, uh, policing of how you act and how how you present yourself okay (laughs) yes i think to bring up because i think i will never you know forget this but like like even like in undergrad i think like the first time where i actually you know express you know my feminine energy you know through like attire you know i just saw the reactions and it was like you know some days you know i had to you know, I had to get myself together, you know, like some days I would, you know, cry, some days I would be sad because, you know, it's a lot to, you know, receive that from, you know, your own people, right? you know, from people that understand how it feels to, you know, be judged or how it yeah. feels to be like stereotyped or like put on like this magnifying glass and, you know, to where moments I was just like, you know, damn, like you would, why would you do this to me when yeah. you know how it is to be, you know, yeah, it's 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 a lot. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so, so where do you remember a moment, or do you remember the moment, or the the experience, or situation that happened when you realized that there has to be some level of compassion that comes from. Uh, not those who are doing these egregious errors to you or or uh, or uh, perpetuating uh, certain stereotypes or other uh, toxic behaviors towards you because of how you show up in the world, um, but to yourself and that compassion that you had to figure out or had to realize that you had to have for these people for those who who did these things to you. Was there a time that that you realized that, okay, this is coming from a place that is rooted in something very real? Mm -hmm. (laughs) 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 No, but yeah, I do, I do. Yeah, like like I'm asking, like, is there, was there a situation like that happened that, that made you realize like, okay, well, this is bigger than me. This is, this has nothing really to do with me. This has to do with a very real, um, uh, I want to say concept, but, but you get what I'm saying? Like, this is something that is rooted in something that has been throughout our history. That's just manifesting itself right now in the homophobia, transphobia, all of these things that misogyny that we know of today. I'm trying to think but there were like a lot of moments where i thought but i think like the true moment was even you know during the hrc summit you know where hope did you know the workshop and i think it was titled you know the t and lgbt is silent mm-hmm. and you know i think like during that whole workshop you know it opened my eyes to like a lot you know to how like even we, you know, within the LGBTQ community or queer community, you know, how we was fighting the fight to be accepted, but then look at us, you know, doing it to our own. Right. So like, I think like that moment, it just made me step like out of self Mm -hmm. and to like, you know, acknowledge your fight, but then, you know, see others and try to help others, you know, through theirs as well. Right. And then I had to be, acknowledgeable of like the privileges that even I have as a gay black male, you know, that most trans people of experience, you know, don't even have or even close to. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I think a lot of that. Mm-hmm. 
And I'm so glad that you brought that up because that was probably one of the most transformative workshops, experiences that I've ever had in my life. And I remember uh, it was, oh, who was it? It was Narelle. He, oh, yeah. uh, yes, he like went in on everybody, pretty much everybody at the summit because he had experienced people that were misgendering him, people that were, uh, that were basically uh, dismissing his entire existence and the work that he put in to be his true self. And, and it was, it, it really brought in, and I remember when he was, you know, expressing his, his righteous anger in, in the, that moment, and hope uh, was basically like, no, this is not no to him, but she was, mm -hmm. she was saying, no, this is exactly a representation of what trans people, gender nonconforming people feel when you're put into situations and, and put into a community of people who are supposed to be there for you, who are mm -hmm. supposed to be affirming you and, and not the ones who are perpetuating all of this toxic behavior onto you and you still feel it in that same community. And when, when that was said and, and when that was put in a way that, that I truly understood, and I'm not saying that, you know, I was, you know, misgendering him or, or anything like that, but there was, there was times where I, I was not thinking about other people's experiences and how I showed up and how even my presence can be a trigger for so many people. Because I am, even though I am identified as a queer black man, uh, as a queer man, I, and as, as a black man, my, my presence is massive center. So I, I come into a place and, and I'm passable or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So my mere existence can trigger someone who who does not have that same experience and who has experienced trauma from people that look like me, that I embody that same, you know, that same mentality, that same archetype of, you know, the black man. And I had to realize, and I was crying. I cried. I'm a crier. You know, I was, I was hyperventilating because it was, it dawned on me that in, uh, and now that I look back on it, I was like, okay, that was probably not the best time to, you know, show my emotions in that way because it's sort of, in my mind, I was like, okay, that was kind of like uh, a little like white tears moment. It was like, you know, the guilt that, you know, but. But, but no, I, I think people need to see that. You know, I think, and it, it, it was beautiful, like how you express your emotion and how, you know, he expressed his. Yeah. And I think, you know, people need to see, like, how this affects us. Because, like, even when, you know, he expressed his, you know, frustration and anger, you know, how people reacted, it was like, you know. Yeah, you know, it was like, wait, what? What are you doing? Instead of, like, understanding. Him. Right. Absolutely. And I think, that, I think that speaks for, like, you know, those of the trans experience, you know, for us as queer, black, gay men, and for straight, you know, cisgender men that, we are not frustrated and angry at each other. Absolutely. We are angry at our conditions. Yeah, exactly. Like we are angry at our place in this society, like our place in this world. Right. But because we cannot, you know, address the, that to those, you know, accountable, mm -hmm. we do it to each other. Right. Absolutely. Kind of, you see it? And, I, and that hit even, even more. I can't remember if Pose was out by the time we went to HRC, but uh, I can't remember for what. I feel like it came out June of some, it came out in June, I think, of some year, but yeah. there was a scene in Pose, mm -hmm. and it was when Blanca was speaking to, to her son, who, what was his Damon? name? Damon? Damon? Which one? Yeah, that's the character. The yeah, dancer. Damon. Damon. Yeah, Damon. Okay, okay. Uh, she was speaking to, to Damon, and she said, um, 
I think he was apologizing for how he acted towards her on the street or whatever. Oh, yeah. He said something along the lines of, uh, it's okay or like, you know, it's, it, it's, it's fine. You're a black gay man in America. Mm-hmm. You, there has to be somebody who you feel superior to or mm-hmm. something along those lines. Uh-huh. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I was like, wow, that is so, that, there's so much truth and so, so much sorrow and, and tragedy in that reality because it's like we've been taught for so long and we've seen for so long what it looks like to be successful, what it looks like to be, uh, to hold power and, and to hold these, these different truths or, or whatever, what have you in this country and really in this world. And that has been predicated on the oppression of other people that aren't white, that aren't white men. And that is how we see, uh, that is how we hold power. That is how we uh, attribute our own validity is Mm. by adopting the same, the same strategy that mm-hmm. white people, that white, stri- that straight white men have enacted on so many different minority groups for mm-hmm. so, for centuries, and it's so sad because I feel like a lot of times we don't understand that that we we don't, and when I say we, I mean black people as a whole. Mm-hmm. We don't understand that that is exactly what we're doing when when we show up in spaces and don't account for the uh the misogyny or the sexism or the homophobia mm-hmm. transphobia all of these things that we've been uh conditioned to to believe are truths mm-hmm. and and it even goes far as to say like there and i in like recent years especially with the me too movement and times up and and all of these different things that we've seen like in the media that there's been this apparent war on on masculinity and when i say war on masculinity i'm i mean that that's i'm using that term because that's a term that's been used uh, mm-hmm. by some some men in you know the media and they they feel as though they can't be you know their full selves and I, i'm very curious on what your perspective is because i remember when we were talking about what we were going to discuss mm-hmm. that you've had a you've had like a chance to to really sit with yourself and and even go out of yourself to understanding other people's perspectives and how that influences how we treat one another so what what is what have you learned and what have what are you now um seeking to find and and what truths are you looking looking for in relation to this this new uh i guess I, well, I use warm masculinity, but on, on this new normal that that we're in, we're we're seeing an eruption of consciousness in in the like in the face of different identities. Mm-hmm. Mm. I'm trying to say how to put this, but like during the time, like where you know the deaths of you know Brianna, you know Ahmad, and then Tony McDade, you know where I kind of saw like people from our community, like the willingness to not acknowledge, you know, Tony McDade and like a countless of other, you know, black trans people's death. And I was like, you know, where is this coming from? Like, like where, like, what is this indifference? And, you know, like I sought out to like see the root of that. And, you know, during my like research, I just see how most of that is like, those roots like lead all the way back to like slavery like how like even then you know there was a war on black you know masculinity or like even specific you know the black masculine principle so like what that meant for us as black people you know as a nation and i think you know the oppressors of the slave owners when they saw that you know they you know i think they thought to themselves you know we have to break that And I thought, you know, kind of putting myself in their shoes, Mm -hmm. you know, or their, you know, sense of, you know, strategy, you know, to break us as a community, you know, they had to start 
with the family. You know, because I think like for each family is similar to like a nation. And I think for them, you know, they thought, you know, to break the black family, family, you have to break the black man. And to break the black man, you then have to relate him to like nothingness or like invalidate his existence. And then from then, you know, the whole nation will collapse. And that's what we have seen, you know, throughout history and like through even like today to where for like black men, we don't know our place or we're somewhat, how do say this? We're somewhat like orphans, like in the society mm. to where we measure our lives and our success and we measure everything. But then we have to ask ourselves, where do we get this ruler? Because like most systems that white people have, we cannot relate with. Right. Like capitalism, masculinity, monogamy. It's like a lot of things that, you know, we adopted because during slavery, we were stripped of all of that. And I think like even post-slavery, we like never got a chance to debrief. Like we never got a chance to like sit down. You know, some may have, but as a collective, as a community, we never got a chance to like see like how that affected us. Like psychologically, mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually, you know, how many of our day-to-day -day living or traditions were just like stripped of us to where we felt we were kind of like blank yeah. and to where, you know, we were brought, you know, to America at that time and we had to adopt the ways of living where it was rooted in whiteness or Eurocentric, yeah. you know, ideals and beliefs that don't work for us. <laughs> <laughs> That just don't work for us. It doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. And even when we say like there's a war on masculine principles or the principles of masculinity, it's almost like I I take a step back with that because I I get like that that there is truth in that. I feel like right now that we are in a time where it's not necessarily a war on these principles or on these, you know, uh, masculine ideals or, or however you want to say it. Um, it's almost like we are in an age of reimagining what that looks like. Reimagining what masculinity and femininity and how the two can come together to create this beautiful, um, uh, powerful, uh, entity that we can all, you know, step into and and be our true selves in. Mm -hmm. Because, like, when you say war on, you know, masculine, or even if you put war in front of anything, it's almost like them versus us, you know. Mm -hmm. and that, um, well, do you feel? How do you feel, black men, that hold these uh, these toxic? Uh, this toxic understanding of, you know, queer people, uh, trans people, all of these different identities, how do you feel like they actually uh, see these, uh, see people that, that might identify in, in, in those, uh, by those mm -hmm. terms or, yeah, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. I think like because of like, what our ancestors went through mm -hmm. and you know that pain being you know brought on and undealt with i think they see our presence as a trigger to you know their place in society you know what they've been through and i think when they see us they they don't see us for us like who we are they see you know that they see the right. pain they see the trauma and they see you know and they project that Right. You know, unconsciously and even some people consciously. Right. And I think like that's like what it is. Like like even for like black men, like even like as men, like we can't even enjoy those privileges. Yeah. Because like even with that, we sit at the intersection of being, you know, devalued as a race, but then also, you know, trying to enjoy the privileges of being a man. And we try to like I'm gonna say we, or for some people, they try to like 
emulate like the white man. Right. You know, to where, you know, we measure ourselves to their systems. You know, we have to be realistic. You know, black men were deprived of like any and all means of like provisions and security. You know, and this was not in made. We ain't did this. <laughs> like this was <laughs> like this was systematically, like this was right. intentional. And you know, and I think for most people within the community, you know, they have to take a step back and they have to see that, you know, my guilt, you know, does not ensure your innocence. Mm. Can you say that and one I more think, time? <laughs> my guilt does not ensure, you know, your innocence. And I think we all don't understand how, you know, what we do daily, you know, affects to the either the success or the downfall of our community. Yeah. And I think once we understand that. <sighs> yeah, we, it'll be smooth. Well, not really smooth sailing, but we'll definitely be, you know, a lot more happier, a lot more uh, in tune with one another, I feel. Now, I will, I want to push back a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, on this idea of uh, the black man being uh, deprived of pretty much everything, identity, spirituality, all of these things. Where does black men were, were not the only ones that were deprived of this thing? Oh, no. Black, no. Women, black women, black uh, gender non-conforming folks, because they were here a long time ago. They've always been here. Uh, we just have language for it now. Where, at, where do we, uh, as Black men, where can, where do we hold space for them? Where can we, when do, when do we say, okay, there was and there is uh, definite uh, demeaning and uh, all of these things on Black men but that was also on those who don't identify as a man. So, so where do we hold space for them? Where can, because it is, it's almost like, sometimes it feels as though uh, we want to, uh, we want the sympathy, not sympathy, we want the empathy, we want the compassion, we want all of these things because we have gone through a lot of, a lot of this and all of this is true, but, we do that on to the degradation of our sisters and uh, our other siblings. So where do we hold space for them? How can how can we how can we still uh, affirm them and be uh, be though that beacon of light that's for other people to to come into this space and come into ourselves as their full selves without perpetuating such trauma onto them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a mutual effort. You know, I think for, you know, black, gay and queer men, I think we have to take a step back. And then even for like black, you know, cisgender men, they have to take a step back. You know, take a step back and like step out of self, like remove ego and like just see each other for like what we've been through, like step into each other's sh shoes as they say, mm -hmm. and like see it from their perspectives. Because I think, and like I said, like earlier, you know, the key to any relationship or like the key to any, you know, communication is the management of difference. Mm -hmm. And I think once we get past that, then we will be able to see each other for who we are and work and, you know, work towards that. I, and like, oh, you said what? Now I was about to say, like, even conversations like these, mm -hmm. you know, to where people can see how, you know, brother, you're not angry at me, you know, yeah. you're angry at what you've been through. Right. And I think, even like with that conversations, like, I think, like, for most black queer men, I think, you know, we have to be mindful of how we even use the term like homophobia. Okay. Can you explain and, that? Mm -hmm, so like, because some people use the term as dismissive. Like if I come in contact with somebody, you know, I'm not going to judge you. You know, it's basically, you're not equipped for this conversation. 
And based on that, I cannot judge you on that. You know, you're just not equipped for this conversation. Like you have no idea, you know, it's, it's like a lack of education or a lack of responsibility, you know, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Mm. And I think, you know, even when we face, how can I say that? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But like, I'm not I, saying like, not use the term at all, but not in a way where it's right. like, like, oh, you humble, I don't want to say you. Right. You know, with, like dismissive, like it's like, you know, because if we do that, then the problem lingers. You know, yeah. they will go on, you know, still having the same attitudes. And I think so, depending on, oh. No, go ahead, sorry. Like depending on like the situation, like even like when I come across like people who have like homophobic, you know, ideas or beliefs, you know, I, I think to myself, like, is this, is this a person that I can, you know, have this conversation with? Mm. You know, if not, then, you know, so be it. But then if, you know, you have to have that conversation. It's almost like the, the saying, meeting people where they are. Mm. Like, you have to, because if you don't, then, I mean, you're not going to get anything from it anyway. But who... Is it up to the people who are the oppressed to educate those who are doing, who are perpetuating the oppression? Mm. Because isn't that, isn't that almost like, isn't that almost like walking into a ring knowing that you're going to get like trampled by so many different people, but still you're there to provide whatever it means mm. oh that's good it's a, it's a conversation it's, it's like it's not even for it, that's not even for like just you know queer folks in the black community and and those who aren't right it's it's like the same conversation people have like with black people and white people when they say like it's not my you know, it's not my duty to educate you on such and such. But I think that there are a bit, there's some nuances that are different with those in our community, or the Black community. Because, I mean, it's our community, right? And it's still, it's still our family, it's still, you know, our people. So so is it up to people who who are the oppressed to educate those who aren't? <laughs> That's tricky. I wouldn't say it's up to people, mm -hmm. but I think like if we attack, you know, anti, you know, blackness or anti, you know, gay on fronts where, how can I say this? Mm -hmm. You got me so good. It's great. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> no, because this is something. This is something that I've really been. I wouldn't say struggling with, but it's definitely something that I've been uh, trying to understand for myself. Because on one hand, I'm like, no, but it's not because, like, I if you have people here, like, if we uh, speak about the trans community, like, they are trying their hardest to walk out the door and be their full their full selves without experiencing some sort of violence towards them like even walking out their door and that's with with all of us i would say but definitely more prevalent with the black trans community that uh, what even even attempting to live a, a life of that is a, a fulfilled life that is one where they can where they can even smile right is is an act of revolution is an act of uh rebellion against what it means to be a person or a, a someone who is validated in this society right so if they're already dealing with so many things that they themselves are are dealing with like internally and in trying to present in a way that is comfortable for them, 
So we have to put this other duty onto them to now know, go, now you go out there and you educate people who are doing the harm to you or who might trigger you in, in reminding you of the harm that you experience at some point in your life. Mm-hmm. That's something that I've been like tossing up because like with myself, I'm able to do that with my family because, and with other people, but like definitely with my family, I feel like there's a duty for me to, to not necessarily educate them, but have conversations that they might normally not have if I wasn't in their lives. And I'm, you know, blessed enough to have a family that's open to listening and all that mm-hmm. stuff. Well, that might be then. That might be answering my own question. Yeah, but I think like what you said, ah, oh, I forgot. But what you said, like when, like how, when they live authentically, how mm-hmm. that itself is a revolution. Yeah. I think that's the answer. Mm-hmm. Like just showing up as your true self and coming to that front, you know, where where it's not, you know, please accept me, please accept me, but you know, I don't need your acceptance, but you are going to respect and validate right. my existence. Right. And I think it's when it's like, when the ball is on our court, you know, I think, you know, that's when, you know, things can get like, cause like if it's on their court, you, we don't know what the hell they're going to do with the ball. Right. But I think like when it's on our court and like we have that power, I think that, you know, itself like makes a difference. So, you write in the uh, blog, um, Being Black and Gay in America, a common misconception that most people have regarding the Black queer community is that we must always be Black first. Personally, for my both identities, for me, both my identities have influenced me equally in shaping my life and experiences, one no more than the other. Consequently, the unique challenges of queer black people, black men are often overlooked. So can you like expound upon what you meant in that um, excerpt? Oh yeah, so like even today we have this to where, you know, in the LGBTQ community, you know, they want you, there's like a disconnect for like black gay men in that community because there's kind of like a willingness to not acknowledge, you know, our blackness and to where it's like, you know, even like this colorblindness movement, like, no, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> like, you are going to see my color, but not see it from a place to where you treat me differently, but see it through a place to where you understand me. Right. And I think, oh, you said something else. Um, I said, Personally, for me, both identities have influenced me equally in shaping my life and experiences, one no more than the other. Consequently, the unique challenges of queer black, black men are often overlooked. Oh, yeah, and then, like, even with, like, with our black identity, you know, most spaces that, you know, we come to in, in that community, it's where, you know, they want you to be like less gay, like be black first, you know, like, like you, you're welcome into the space, but don't come here with that, you know, gay shit. Right, you know, right. It's kind of, it's kind of like that to where it puts us in a place where we feel like we have to choose. Mm-hmm. And I read something that Baldwin said to where, you know, he expressed himself unapologetically and yeah. where he felt as if both identities were like inseparable. Like, yeah. you will not make me choose one. Like, you cannot do that to a person. However, we do have to understand that, you know, both are unique in its own way. So, like, the gay, the gay struggle cannot, you know, equate to the Black struggle. You know, those are two, 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 different, two right. different struggles that, you know, should not be put, like, on the same platform. Right. But they so, definitely yeah. inform one another once mm-hmm. you are in that intersectionality of the two. Yes. Yeah. And so speaking of Baldwin, uh, I, he is one of my favorite <laughs> artists, authors, uh, words, oh. everything. I am a Baldwin fan. <laughs> and when you say 
Baldwin rarely filtered his personality for the comfort of others, a trait that as as I grew older came to share. Mm -hmm. Through Baldwin, I learned individual freedom, saying no to conforming to societal or gender stereotypes or norms, rejecting from the status quo. So what does what does freedom what did that look like for you? What did that how did that show up in your life? So freedom was where because let me see freedom. For like most of my like intimate, you know, relationships, you know, I was in a place to where, you know, like you know my natural energy, like I'm a healer, you know, people gravitate towards me to where they, you know, they have a problem, but it was like more so of that, you know, to where like my relationships and my friends, you know, I gave, I gave, I gave, you know, I was always in this place where I felt as if I had to please people or I had to appease to, you know, what they think that I was or their idea of me. So like for a long time, I've spent my life, you know, living like that. So like freedom for me, was, you know, the day that I chose to stop doing that, you know, the day that I chose me and, you know, the day that I chose to like live my life the way I see it and the way I want to, you know, like canceling out, you know, any outside noise yeah. and, you know, listening to, you know, me, listening to Rodney. And I think like that was like the peak of like my freedom. And ever since then, you know, ever since choosing me, you know, it has just been. Uh, it has been wonderful. Because, like, a lot is just burdens, yeah. expectations. You know, I just felt all of that, like, was just off of my shoulders. And I yeah. felt, like, the word, I felt free. Like, I felt. You know, I felt like I was back in control. Like I had the we saw the game control. <laughs> so like how how did you how did you get there? Like what was it a situation where you it was really just you were just fed up with your experiences that you were having with other people? Did you like was it a moment or was it just like something that you grew into and you realized that you realized what you were doing and how it was a detriment to yourself, your soul, your, your mind, everything to you. And was it just a decision or was it something that you had to like, sort of like fall into? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the pinnacle of that would be like my recent relationship. So that relationship, this was during my 11th and 12th grade year, and this was an abusive relationship. And it was abusive, you know, physically, mentally, and emotionally, and it was draining. And I think, like, the beginning of that relationship, you know, I saw the potential in him, but I didn't pay attention to, like, the credentials. You know, like I saw the angel behind the monster disguise. Like I saw like the inner child, like screaming within him, you know, help me, you know, hear me, you know, comfort me. And I saw that instead of him. So, you know, the healer within me spoke only to that. And I think that is like most of like the reason why I stayed. But like, even like within that relationship, I had to like learn a lot. Because in that relationship, I was just giving, you know, like giving, you know, not getting anything back into where, you know, he had most control, like over my life, like to where I felt like I was almost like a, I don't want to say a puppet, but yeah, like he had like my strings. And I think like through that experience you know especially like the day that I left him and like that day I will like never forget because like that day I chose you know me you know even in the midst of like what he was going through you know that's his battle you know but in this instance I had to choose me because I gave up on me Mm -hmm. and like inside I can feel myself like dwindling 
you know, kind of like a, like a dead rose or like a dead garden because I was giving like all of my resources, all of my energy, all of my time and space to him and not to like myself. So I think like that, that self experience like just taught me a lot. And like, that is like the pusher of like the reason like why I have to choose me because there was a time in my life where me, you know, was almost gone. Yeah. Wow. What's your definition of God? Oh, definition of God. I think God is me, you know, God is you. And I think for most people, you know, we see God as like a separate, you know, entity outside of ourselves. I'm sorry, I got a call outside of ourselves to where it's like, no, like the God is inside of you. You know, God is like that power, like that. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know how to explain it, but I think you get, do you get? Yeah, absolutely. God is you. God is me. God is mm-hmm. all of us. And I think like if we hold that power within ourselves instead of outside of ourselves, mm-hmm. oh, the things. Yeah. we can do it's very interesting that you say that because there was a time when i i think this was it has to be two years ago where i really started meditating and really started you know really taking control of my spirituality and myself mm-hmm. and my mind and all of these things and I, I don't know what happened one day, but when I was doing it, because as I would meditate, I would meditate for a certain amount of time and then I would pray. Mm-hmm. I would pray like for the last part of it. And then like, that's, you know, how I would do it. And there was just this one time where it was, you know, the time for me to pray. And instead of imagining the words escaping out of me, because mm-hmm. that's how I would normally pray. Like I was praying to, to something that was outside of me, something that, you know, the words in my mind were lifted out from my mind or from my, you know, and going into the space that was, you know, not me. Mm-hmm. And it was just when I sat there and it was time for me to pray, instead of imagining the words going outward, I imagined mm-hmm. them coming back into me. And when I tell you, th- I... I can't even describe what the feeling was, but it was in that moment that I realized, because I had never felt that before. I had never felt my entire body almost lifted off of the ground. And it felt as though I was light. I felt like I was one with everything around me and that I was envisioning, like I was in, it, it was so weird. Have you, you know, have you watched That's So Raven? Mm-hmm. Okay, remember she gets the visions and it like that tunnel thing? <laughs> like I, I imagine I imagine myself going into myself like that, like it was a tunnel, and then once I arrived, it was the galaxy. I know like that sounds a little you know whatever, but it was in that moment that I realized I am everything on this earth, I'm everything outside of this earth i'm every i'm I am a spiritual being, this universe, you, me, the trees everyone that I've come in contact with, everyone that I haven't come in contact with, all of us are connected in a way that is so much greater than what we can even understand for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And it, it was, honestly, I, I can't even, I, I can't even like de- describe, truly describe mm-hmm. how I felt in those moments. But okay, I digress. The, no, um, but I, I, I agree. Like you tapped yeah. into that energy. And like yeah. you said earlier, I think, you said that like everything is like a frequency mm-hmm. and like everything like revolves around energy. And when yep. you took that energy inward, I mean, like how you said it was powerful. It, it was, it was. And I, and it was almost like I imagined my entire life. Mm. Like it was almost like it was flat and it was, it, it was, a, it was a moment. It was wonderful. <laughs> it was wonderful. That's but, great. um, uh, what does hope look like to you? Hope. Hope. Ay, ay, ay. 
I don't know about hope. Mm. Because I think for some time, like I, I can acknowledge like what hope does. Right. Like hope gives us, you know, somewhat of a reason or somewhat of a purpose to keep going. Mm -hmm. However, I then have to be realistic. You know, hope is more so of like a concept, you know, to where, you know, action is like a fact. So I think I love hope, but hope like match with like action and not okay. just, you know, hope. Gotcha. Like I think like the Bible says, or is it a song? My yeah. hope is still. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. But like a hope match with action. Okay. It's almost like the saying that's in the Bible as well. Faith without works is dead. Yes. Yeah. That. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, hope and faith you can sort of mm -hmm. mingle the two. But yeah. So what's one thing you wished you were able to learn about yourself sooner? Mm. It's like I want to answer that question, mm -hmm. but then again, it's like I wouldn't change like anything. Mm -hmm. Only because, like, I think that, like, every event in my life was, like, a stepping stone for, like, the next. Right. And I think, like, it had to happen to, like, enter, like, this new level. Had to happen to, like, enter this new level. So it's kind of like, eh. I don't know. I think I'm just, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's fine. If it's, like, I, I understand that. I agree wholeheartedly that everything that i have been through everything that you know i've experienced or the lessons that i've learned or lessons i have yet to learn like they are all in due time and they have happened when they were supposed to happen because i am exactly where i'm supposed to be i honestly believe that honestly yeah. true so what is the difference between living and existing mm. I think, and this, that can speak to like a lot of what goes on like today within this generation. Mm -hmm. Like it's sad to say, but I think like many people are just living, you know, they're either living through their past or they're living for the future. And I think with existence, existence is like living in the present moment. Mm -hmm. Like saying, you know, learning from your past, you know, of course being hopeful for the future, but existing in the present like acknowledging like what you do daily, how that contributes to your future. And I think for most people, you know, they're, it's like they're living in the expectation of what's to come instead of what's now. What's there right in front of you. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like there's there, and that's why some people feel empty because they're longing for the future that's not there instead of the present to where they cannot enjoy like the little things or like enjoy like the moments or like what you said, what they have now. Wow, that's an interesting. I didn't even think of it like that. <laughs> uh, what is one thing you wish the world had more of? Love. Agreed. Love, love, love. I think like in one of my posts, I posted revolution where you can see like the word in love. I mean, the word love. Mm -hmm. And I think with love, most people think like love is like an emotion, which it is, but I think love is like more so of like a verb or an action, you know? Like love is like a state of being, mm. you know? You know, I love you, you know, whether, you know, you can provide for me or whether you can do, you know, anything for right. me because I love you. Like kind of like unconditional love. Yes. Yeah. And I think with love, you know, comes, of course, you know, understanding. Oh, love, love comes like with understanding, mm -hmm. compassion, empathy, you know, all of that encompasses in just one, you know, one solidified energy. Right. And I think if we, and love is also intentional. And I think if we move throughout life intentionally, I think it'll make like a big difference. Like, why are you doing this? And like right. to the to the to the, to the, to the, to the, to the 
Yeah, so like, why are you doing this in Chiswick? I'm just <laughs> right. Why that. are you doing this thing? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. I love that. And I had to, I kind of like had to learn that. Mm-hmm. I know you've noticed, like, like on Instagram, like my last post is like, I think like two years ago. I don't know, but I haven't posted like in a lab in a long mm-hmm. time. And it's because I'm I'm kind of like going through a rebirth to where I felt like like I had, you know, to create, you know, I had to, you know, consistently like create and do this and do this and do this mm-hmm. to where, you know, to where mm-hmm. I kind of like had to take a step back. Cause I think like with most people, like with social media, you know, they think that they have to like look the part you know and present present to this idea of like perfectionism to like where they're like live their lives out like as a facebook post like oh you know mm -hmm." (laughs) absolutely and so thank you so much rodney that was a great way to end and cap everything off uh, again, I appreciate you so, so very much for agreeing <laughs> to this, for being you. I'm so grateful that I know you as a person, that I can share this space with you in other spaces. Uh, it's just always a joy. I wish I could hug you, um, <laughs> but you know, yeah, digital, virtual. Uh, I hope all the clothes and family and everybody's, you know, healthy and, and doing well. And if not, like my prayers are out for them and mm-hmm. everyone that you consider. Thank helpful. you. And thank you so much for inviting me into this space. I really appreciate it. And I I I, I love, you know, what you are doing. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's kind of funny because, you know, the first time that I saw you or the first time like we met. Mm-hmm. Like you moved my life, and to like to know that I did the same, you know, vice versa. You know, it's it's kind yeah. of it's beautiful. It is, yes. <laughs> I, oh, oh my goodness, I could go on and on about this. Like, <laughs> thank you, love you. I love you too. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch or listen to this conversation. As I've said many times before, I am a huge fan of Rodney for all that he represents and for being a beacon of light for those around him. Please go check out his blog, The Bridge, and you can follow him on Instagram. Both are in the description below. We are uploading new chapters every Sunday and Wednesday on YouTube, Spotify, and wherever you can find your podcasts. Our Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook pages at Readin' and Ragin' can also be found in the description below. So if you are interested in continuing the conversation, please like, comment, share, and subscribe to be a part of the RRC family. One conversation can change the trajectory of a person's life for the better. Together, we can make that happen for you, for me, and for everyone around us. Thank you so much again for tuning in. Take some time to look inward and always start with forgiveness. Remember to wear your mask, remember to vote, and we'll see you on the next one. Love always.